which have blacked us out. I think we've had about 10 seconds uh, on the occasion of the announcement of running for uh, president on the network uh, news, uh, February 24th. Uh, the public broadcasting, unfortunately, has also, with the exception of one afternoon national public radio program, uh, Talk of the Nation has blacked us out. We've got, uh, we're not on Charlie Rose, we're not on Diane Rehm, we're not on Terry Gross. Uh, we've got to turn this around because uh, uh, this is political bigotry. This is not newsworthiness judgment. This is political bigotry. They basically are playing the role of pawns of the two-party duopoly and saying to the American people, we're not going to relay anything by third-party or independent candidates, even though historically it's those candidates in the 19th and 20th century that brought us first the issues that have made America what we like most about our country. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the current state of media, the big five, you know, media conglomeration and things like that and how that you know, affects the American people as far as media consolidation and stuff like that? Well, it's a hijacking of public property. Uh, the public areas belong to the American people, the real estate agents, the Federal Communications Commission, the people are the landlords, the radio and TV stations are the tenants, and they pay us no rent. They get their license free ever since the Radio Act of 1927, and they decide who says what, who doesn't, 24 hours a day on radio and TV. I mean, you want to talk about the total opposite to any kind of democratic media? And can you have a democracy without a democratic media? No. So what we have to do is reassert a very simple principle that conservatives and liberals should agree on. We own the public airways. We're going to pull back one or two hours drive time and prime time, charge the radio and TV station corporations rent, use some of that money to put uh, fine production facilities, hire good reporters and editors, and have the people's media every day. So what would, if you were in office, what would you do to break up the big five? Well, first of all, I think there's serious antitrust violations. I mean, they are now moving into... A market share that uh, violates antitrust criteria, so you can move to break them up and, and instead of their increasing the concentration. Uh, the second is you can uh, recondition the license. After all, the government gives them their license. Without it, they go dark, and we can say you have to behave this way, that way. You have to give time to ascertaining local issues. You have to have a fairness doctrine. Uh, you can't monopolize uh, Rush Limbo style. One, uh, one viewpoint day after day on the public property. I wrote Rush, Rush Limbaugh a letter a few weeks ago, which he's too cowardly to answer, saying, Rush, get the heck off welfare. You're just uh, using our property free. You talk about being a capitalist. A capitalist pay for their property when they rent it. Uh, so you're using hundreds of millions of dollars a year of the people's property free. So get off welfare. And if you want to be a capitalist, behave like one. Well, naturally, he didn't want to answer. He's, a, he's the uh, number one monopolistic soliloquist in American radio. And he's a coward. He's a total coward. He, he, he screens uh, the, uh, the questions, and uh, he just can't stand the dialogue. Have you ever heard or seen a uh, Rush Limbaugh debate? No. If you have, I'll show you a visiting Martian. Um, the last thing I want to ask, we're going to have an action segment of the play I think a lot of people feel helpless and, and like, yeah, media, it's a problem, but we don't know what we can do. And so at the play that we're going to have 20 performances, we're going to have a direct appeal at the end on what people can actually do to empower themselves to take over the media. And if you wouldn't mind, into the camera, this would be uh, ace night at the play and tell them what they could do right in here. First of all, stop making excuses for yourself and being hopeless, hapless, and helpless. Remember, the Constitution starts, we the people, not the we the corporation. And if you do nothing, the Constitution is, well, the corp, if you do nothing, the corporation is going to run you into the ground. You're coming into adulthood, for example, in your 20s, full adulthood. You're worrying about affordable housing. You're worrying about where you're going to get affordable health insurance, whether your jobs are going to be outsourced to China or India, uh, whether you, you, know, you smoke a joint once in a while, you're going to be arrested and put in jail for five years. Uh, you, you're worried about a lot of things you shouldn't worry about. People your age in Western Europe, they got universal health insurance, they got paid vacations, they got the right to easily form trade unions, they got full daycare, they got paid maternity leave, they got decent public transit, they got all these things. And why should you demand and get them? You can only do it 
You stop looking at screens so much, mobilize with your generation, and start taking over. Go out and vote. Run for elective office. You know, a picket, challenge, rally. That's what you got to do. You got to have the fervor of a dedicated bird watcher. I'll settle for that. Great. Thank you. I mean, they don't address the central issue of American politics, and Canadian politics for that matter. It's the vast concentration of power in fewer and fewer giant corporate hands. And these corporations have far too much control over the lives of the American people, three-quarters of them in a poll. The American people say that's true. And they have far too much control over our government. They are our government. They, they have hijacked every department agency in Washington. They put their executives in high government positions. They got tens of thousands of lobbyists. They got 10,000 political action committees shoveling money into the coffers of both Democrat and Republican uh, politicians. And, and the Democratic Convention, is the only interaction they have with corporations is food, wine, drink, and music. Not exactly the stuff of progressive politics in a country that's supposed to be dedicated to government of, by, and for the people. Well, the corporations don't make a distinction now between the Democrats and Republicans. When the Democrats took control of Congress in January 2007, the K Street lobbyists switched more and more of their funding uh, to the Democrats, and Democrats were saying, okay, we're in power now, start giving us campaign money. So, you know, it's, it's equal opportunity corruption. Now, George Will had the right meaning, but he has the wrong word. We shouldn't use the word elite. We should use the word corporate power. That's what is transcending politics between the two parties. And when it comes to corporate power, Paul, let me tell you, the only difference between the Republican and Democratic Party is the velocity with which their knees hit the floor when corporations come pounding on their door. It is true the Democrats are better on Social Security, uh, gay lesbian rights, other civil rights, uh, but not as much as they used to years ago, number one. Number two, what befits these differences if the similarities in succumbing to corporate power, taking over our elections, taking over our media, taking over our government, globalizing our country, uh, shipping industries and jobs to fascist and communist dictators abroad, what, what, what difference does it make if the similarities in selling out America to fewer and fewer giant corporations who have no allegiance to this country other than to control it or abandon it to China and elsewhere. What difference really does it matter that, 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 that the Democrats and Republicans have different rhetoric and different slogans? Thank you, Mr. Nader. I think we have to wrap it up. It's not a bind, it's not a bind when they have Nader Gonzalez on the ticket, a tried and tested progressive uh, duo that will stand for the people from corporations and demand the government and corporations be our servants, not our masters. Thanks, Mr. Nato. It is a more dangerous group, but the people around Obama, uh, whether supporting Israeli militarism or keeping 50,000 soldiers and military bases in Iraq or doubling number of soldiers in a terrible quagmire in Pakistan, Afghanistan, is still dangerous. They both flunk. We should settle for something better in America. We should learn how to wage peace. We should put forth a humanitarian superpower, which is pragmatically the best way to obtain peace and reduce mindless or state-sponsored terrorism. Okay, we have, we have to go, Paul. I'm being pulled apart okay. here Hold for other media. Okay, I'm Citizen Kate with CitizenKate.tv, and I'm the outsider's view of inside politics. I've been on the campaign trail, the presidential campaign trail, for over a year, and I'm trying to understand what it takes to be a great leader in this country. What do you think it takes to be a great leader? Political fortitude with knowledge. And the thing that has amazed me in my discovery on the campaign trail is just the amount of money that's spent on becoming president. How much money do you think you need to become president of America? Well, we need a lot of uh, voters to volunteer, and, uh, and the more people who volunteer and the Nader Gonzalez campaign, we're going to be on most of the state's mm -hmm. ballots, the less money you need. So maybe we don't need so much money then, because I know I don't have a lot of money to do what I'm well, doing. Well, I mean, we need to get on the presidential debates. That's supposed to be free, mm -hmm. but the two parties control who gets on the stage, and unfortunately the networks play their game. 
What I find interesting too, I went to the Libertarian National Convention and then the Green Party National Convention, and now I'm here at the Democratic National Convention. And the Green Party was like, you know, a cash bar, and here there's just so many parties, I can't even go to all of them. You mean you don't drink that much? Well, I do drink some, but I can't go to all the parties here. It's just crazy. Why do you think that is? Because the Democratic Party is for sale. And just oh. like the Republican Party will be for sale next week in St. Paul. And what are they selling? They're yeah. selling the U.S. government for the best bargain imaginable. For 2 to $3 billion, these corporations buy the U.S. government. That's yeah. worse than a fire sale. That's terrible. I mean, I like to shop at sales, but I don't think that that's right. Well, you're right, and that's why Citizen Kate is different from Citizen Kane. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. My message is peace and hugs. Do you think we can change the world with peace and hugs? We can change the world with peace, hugs, and justice. I love that. I'm going to hug you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so you Citizen Kate. <laughs> oh, my God, that was so awesome. We can change the world, and we shouldn't just sell out. We have to figure out who is going to be the next great leader and vote for that person. <laughs> and it could be Ralph Nader. Think about it. And Gonzalez, his running mate. Oh, and how would I become a running mate? <laughs> Just wait until you're 40 years old. Okay. Well, lay the groundwork. I'm laying it now. Okay. okay so thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. all. Thank you all. Go keep watching. And, okay. and this is great because we are alternative media. We yeah, often absolutely. get kicked out by the big media. Well, so alternative so candidate good. goes for the alternative media. Okay. I love that. So thank you so much thank for your you. time. I really appreciate okay. it.